Welcome to Married to History, where we try to be informative, entertaining, and family-friendly. Aloha! I'm Christopher. I have a fancy piece of paper on my wall that says that I know more about history than most people do. I'm Shirley. I'm a homeschool mom that relies on good curriculum, Christopher, and Annie to teach our kids history. Annie? Do we know an Annie? Actually, we do, but no. Annie, the, the musical. Little Orphan Annie. How do we know it's an Annie? You have a friend, Annie. Well, well besides her. No, that's the we, only one. We, we, we haven't seen her in a while. That's the only one. Oh, okay. Before we get into our episode, let's take a minute to talk about something from a past episode. It's important to keep in mind that Shirley doesn't warn me about our topic beforehand. Yep, it's fun for me to see what he knows right off the top of his head. And that means sometimes we miss things. That means sometimes I embarrass myself. <laughs> if you'd like to hear a more comprehensive and well-prepared episode on any topic, just let us know. So honey, what have we learned since last time? I seem to recall that I massively dropped my intelligence uh, when we were talking <laughs> Never. about when we were talking about Grant in the Mexican War, uh -huh. um, I, if I remember correctly, I I couldn't remember if he was even there or not, and if he was, what his rank might have been. Yeah. But no, he graduated from West Point before the war began, so yeah, he was in the war, and yeah, he was an officer at the least. Uh, what specific rank he held during the war, I don't know. Don't know if he got any promotions or anything of that nature. But he was most definitely an officer in the Mexican War. How embarrassing for you. Very embarrassing. <laughs> Almost as embarrassing as that day I said I do. I mean, wait, did I say that out loud? Yep, you did. Cut, cut that. You'll edit that out, right? Mm, sure, I will. Okay, uh, there was another thing about what, our Emancipation Proclamation episode. Okay. Okay, so I found that map. Go to our social media and you can see this map. And it shows all the states or areas where the Emancipation Proclamation actually affected. And there was that little tiny spot at the bottom of Louisiana that was not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Why was that? I assume that's because that's where New Orleans was, and New Orleans fell to the Union very very early in the war. The Confederacy never got it back. You were telling me something about, like, that was part of their plan. Why did they go all the way to the south there? Okay, so, yeah, the taking New Orleans, taking the Mississippi, was the mm -hmm. second part of the Anaconda plan. The idea was, okay, first part of the plan, cut off the Confederacy from the rest of the world with the mm -hmm. naval blockade. Second part of the plan, cut the Confederacy in two by preventing them from crossing the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. If you're going to control the Mississippi, you have to control New Orleans. I mean, that's the yeah. way in, the way out. I mean, if you have New Orleans, then even if stuff is moving up and down the river, it ain't getting out. Did it work? The Anaconda plan? Yeah, did they do it? Yes. The, the Union won the war. Well, I mean, they won, <laughs> but was it the, thanks you, to that plan? I, I think it was absolutely <laughs> thanks to that plan. I, that while there were many advantages that the North had and some advantages that the South had, mm -hmm. that, this, this would warrant a whole other discussion, okay. I think, on the matter. But I think it is undeniable, and I'm willing to bet that most historians will agree with me, me on this, that the main thing that did the Confederacy in was the naval blockade. Mm. Because of the naval blockade, so the very first part of the Anaconda Plan, arguably the very first thing that the Union did, yeah. even while Robert E. Lee was embarrassing Union Army after Union Army in Virginia, they still had the naval blockade. And the South, the South did not have the means of producing the materials they mm -hmm. needed, much less taking care of their own population in order to be able to prosecute a war. But off the top of my head, I remember trains were big at the time. The South didn't have right. quite as many train tracks or trains as the North did. Mm -hmm. But to make matters worse, in all of the United States, all the factories that were capable of making just the, um, the I don't remember what they were the called. Railroad ties? Just the railroad The rails. So not the ties. The ties are what you secure the railroad to, the, okay. the iron beams to. I don't remember what they were called. Okay. Maybe those were called ties. I, I have know. no idea. I'm getting all mixed up now. But anyway, <laughs> the, the the thing that makes the tracks that the okay. train actually runs on, the iron beams that the track and that the train actually runs on, only one of those factories was in the South, Ooh. and it was in Virginia, the place that was yeah. constantly under attack by the Union Army. That so, would be a problem. So basically, any time any time that the Confederacy had, did a cavalry raid and damaged some train tracks. The Union could very quickly replace those, probably even have them fixed before the day was over, and mm -hmm. I'd say probably it would take them a week to replace those at the most. Right. Whereas the South, any time they lost one of those, that was probably something that was months away from repair at best. Dang. All right, speaking of the Navy and the Civil War, we talked about that ship that sailed all the way to Great Britain to surrender. Oh, yes. Okay, so I looked it up. That was called the CSS... Shenandoah. And in that episode, you weren't sure how long it took them to get there. And then I hyperbolically said 10 years. 
It doesn't take 10 years to sail to Great Britain. <laughs> Depends on how many stops you make. So it was six months. So they didn't know about the surrender until June or August. That's a two-month difference. I was confused by what I read. So anyways, they didn't surrender until late November. Okay. And then last thing, uh, we had a question about how did Nixon appoint Ford as his vice president. Mm -hmm. He didn't run with Ford on his presidential mm -hmm. ticket, so how how did that happen? So uh, I couldn't remember, and in fact, if I I think that at the time I might have said that uh, Nixon fired his yeah. vice president. So no, that is not what happened. Um, his vice president, whose name I'm already forgetting on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he literally yeah. just looked it up. Yeah, I forgot his name already. <laughs> Nobody remembers the vice president's name unless he actually becomes president. Yeah, it's it's, it's an old uh, it's an old game. Mm -hmm. Name me name me three vice presidents. Biden. You should be able to since they've had three presidents in your <laughs> Biden, lifetime. Biden, Ford, Quayle. Very good. And and who's the one who was a crybaby against Bush? Uh, you mean the one that lost the election against him? Yes. That was Gore. Gore. I would have maybe remembered his name Calling if he gave me a minute. was a bit sensitive. The I don't whole, know that he actually shed a tear over the The matter. whole Florida hanging Chad debacle? That's another topic. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so did anyway, Nixon fire this no, no, no name? No, Nixon did not fire this guy. This was, and okay, this was another thing I didn't know. I didn't know it was so close together. So less than a year before Nixon ends up resigning, his vice president resigned. He was uh, in a bit of hot water. There were charges of corruption, um, uh, amongst other things, against him. And uh, he ended up uh, resigning and taking a plea deal. He pled to uh, at least to one count of uh, tax evasion so mm -hmm. that they would drop the corruption charges against him. So that's what happened to him, and then Ford, and then uh, Nixon appointed Ford to replace him. Right. So I like that better because in thinking of the idea of Nixon firing his VP, mm -hmm. that kind of rubbed me wrong. Because I'm like, that does not seem like that's something that the president should have the power to do. Because oh, yeah. because the guy who was VP, while technically was chosen for the job by Nixon, was still elected to that office. Right. The not people have hired by say. Nixon to that office. Yeah. Uh, so, but if the guy resigned, then I'm totally um, understand why. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. Of course, Nixon would pick a replacement, just like the president would, pi would, would pick to replace any member of his cabinet. Yeah, that makes more sense. But it still, yeah, still is cool in that it results in Gerald Ford becoming mm -hmm. the only president that nobody ever voted for. Well, didn't vote for him in a presidential capacity. There. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, hey, honey, I have a history question for you. I love history questions. You know how William the Conqueror wrote the Doomsday Book in 1066? I think he commissioned it. I don't think he wrote it himself, but yes. Yeah, potato, potato. When did he predict the end of the world would be? Okay. So... Isn't that what the Doomsday Book is? Predicting when Doomsday is? All right, so I know... Oh, man, I know that I've heard about this. I know that I've read and seen a lot of <gasps> did talk I about this. Did I stump you? So... If I remember correctly, this is the answer. Number one, no, he did not think the end of the world was coming. Two, the mm -hmm. Doomsday Book was basically just the most efficient and detailed mm -hmm. inventory system that had probably ever been done up to that point in time, yeah. giving the king a very accurate count of everything that he had. So like it was, it was I, I don't remember all the details off the top of my head, but it was very accurate in that like he knew exactly how many trees there were in England. What? He knew exactly how many sheep there were in England. So it was just it, like a census. It was, uh, I'd say more so an inventory, uh, supply uh, inventory, if you will, okay. of, of all the things that were in this domain that he had. And it... I was about to say it took them a while to make this, but actually I think that the time they spent, the, the, the time it took them to put this together, I think that was actually uh, comparatively short given the means of travel and inventory that they would have had at the time. Huh. But it was a marvelous undertaking, and if I, the other thing that I was going to say, if I remember correctly, our calling it the Doomsday Book has something to do with either a mistranslation or the way that language changes mm -hmm. and it meant something different at right. the time or was given this name of the doomsday book while still possibly meaning something else at yeah. a later point in time because now that i'm saying that i want to 
say that there was something that they didn't even call it the Doomsday Book when it was written. It was called something else. Well, but, but yeah, you you got me to the point where I am not positive about yeah. uh, about most of the things that I just said. The only things that I'm fairly positive mm -hmm. about are were yes, it was an inventory book, mm -hmm. and yes, it was insanely accurate. Wow. So all I know about it is I I would suspect yes, it's it's a it's a weird thing going on with the language from that whatever old English they spoke or. Mm -hmm. French, maybe, because he was from so, France. So, no, so anyway, no, hold on. William so, would have spoke France, but the people there, they did not speak French. They spoke their Anglo-Saxon okay. languages. Yeah. Either way, there's something funny going on with the language because we spell it D-O-M-E-S-D-A-Y. So it's Domesday, mm -hmm. but I've heard it pronounced Doomsday. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to look that up and see what uh, that exactly That would be something that I don't know. Perhaps I am like so many names that have existed in throughout time. Perhaps I am one of those people that have been pronouncing it wrong all this time. Or maybe but if it's... I were to say the Doomsday Book, whether I call it the Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book or the Dunsday Book, yeah. I'm pretty sure that other historians would know what I'm talking about. Right, and unless they don't know and they're wondering if it's about an end of the world prediction. I suppose that is possible. <laughs> All right, so why did William the Conqueror create this this census? Why was he counting everything in, in England? What's that about? You owned a business once, right? Yeah. Did you ever do inventory? Yeah. Why? Make sure I knew what I had. Hmm. Whenever you went shopping, or sorry, you went shopping for more supplies, right? Right. Did you do inventory again? Well, yeah. Why? Okay, but why did William the Conqueror have to do this? I'm going to answer your question <laughs> if you answer my question. Why? Because I wanted to make sure I wasn't buying too much of something or I bought enough of something else. All right, so William is a vast landowner. He has large land holdings in Normandy did he have in, nor in northern France. And he just conquered England, which was a huge area of land, a heck of a lot bigger than his claimed lands in France. Uh -huh. That means a lot of people. That means a lot of stuff. He wanted to know what his inventory was. He wanted to know what his loot was. Was this not normal? Because I've heard the Doomsday Book talked about, like, it's this amazing, out-of-the-ordinary thing. Why else would we know about it and know the name of it this many years later? Was this not normal? That's fair. My guess would be... I don't know for certain, but my guess would be that we know about this thing, well, first off, because English traditions and history has survived and endured a lot better than other okay. European cultures have, uh, or a lot of other Europeans' history have. But also, this was a bigger conquest than was average at the time. Mm. And again, I think the idea of how accurate it was was also significant. Yeah. So back in William's time, land is constantly changing hands. Okay. People are constantly fighting with each other. And it's usually, to the best of my recollection, it's usually not all that big. Or at least by comparison, it is not as big as taking all of England. The British I, I Isles know, aren't that big. It's an island. The British Isles aren't that big, yes, but they are bigger than your average kingdom. Okay. Uh, to, to give it to a scale, um, an old ideal for the measurement of a kingdom would mm -hmm. be a 20-mile radius. I have no okay. idea. I have no idea how many acres that is. But I say it wouldn't mean anything to me anyways. I, say <laughs> I have a, no idea. <laughs> I say a 20-mile radius because that's the distance that any man living in the kingdom could mm -hmm. walk to, could walk away from before the end of the day oh. and uh, or, sorry the maximum distance Started that a guy would be able to day. walk away at the end of the day yeah. so ideally then okay your kingdom is anywhere you can get to within that day's time Yes, it would take several days to walk across all of England yeah. because it is a big area we call it a small island mm -hmm. but actually as islands go unless mm -hmm. you're counting Australia, Australia it's a pretty big island I guess that's a lot of square miles of land. Mm -hmm. uh, put it, if, I don't I remember what the exact measurement off the top of my head, but uh, Hadrian's Wall was, I want to say, 10 to 15 miles across, if I'm remembering correctly. It might have been bigger than that. So that's, that's And that's just at that northern narrow point of where England is. Oh, is that the most narrow some, point? That's not the, I don't know if it's the most narrow point, but as England goes northern, the yeah. island kind of narrows a bit. Okay. So Hadrian's Wall is built in the north, so there's a lot more land and a lot more mileage across yeah. to the south of that. But that's way farther in the future than than William. Never mind. Past. That's what I said. That, was that is in the not past. what you said. <laughs> that you was implied that Hadrian's Wall was Hadrian's built Wall. after I know what I said. William conquered Hadrian's Normandy. Wall was built or before William, William the Conqueror joined the chat. Mm -hmm. Joined the chat? 
It's... I'm watching horrible history too much. No, that's how your children talk. That's how people talk. Isn't William the Conqueror chatting with somebody? Oh, no, that's King John is chatting with somebody when they get him yeah. to sign the Magna Carta. Yeah. Okay. No, it's just like, anyways, it's a thing. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I don't remember what I was saying. Oh, so the, so it's England is a heck of a lot more land mm. than your average conquest of the time. Okay. So there would so it's understandable that the inventory process would have been a lot harder to calculate because there's uh -huh. a lot more things to check. So why bother? Just be like, why bo build your castle and be like, dude, look at this land. I got a lot. I don't need to know that there's twenty five swans versus 24 i just know there's a lot right are you trying to hurt me with your <laughs> ignorance i'm just saying why does it matter so much that it has to be down how to the penny you, how can you actually say that why does it matter so much again you were a businesswoman are you telling me you didn't keep track of your records your transactions everything down to the penny yes because every penny mattered to me because i'm poor and what makes you think that every resource i'm not counting the peasants mm -hmm. but every resource in a king's land in a warlord's mm -hmm. land is not important to him okay that's fine that's fine i'll believe you <laughs> you can go on I, I don't understand why you're arguing that Ugh, why could he have actually wanted to know what was i'm there? just saying that's I'm a sure, lot of work <laughs> to be clear i'm sure there have been plenty of other kings conquerors whatnot mm -hmm. in history that did not undertake right? such a project we don't know too much about them, though, do we, in their conquests? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> okay. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, it was a lot of work, and this is one of the things that makes it kind of cool. It was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Like I said, it was unprecedented for the time, yeah. and it was, if I'm, again, if I remember correctly, it was super accurate. Mm -hmm. All these things make it stand out more than probably any other works that anybody might have commissioned about the time to mm -hmm. find out what the inventory was of their new lands. Okay. So William the Conqueror, he's called the Conqueror because he conquered, right? Did he only conquer... Great Britain, or did he do other stuff? Technically, yes. So he 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 went in other battles. He co arguably conquered other places. So most of William's affairs were in France. Yes, he conquered okay. England, but then he left and he rarely ever went back. And when Wait, he did, he stayed real? there for a very short time. Yeah, he didn't even. But he like made himself their first king. I wouldn't say he made himself their first king because there were other kings of England. Right, but this is just where e England today yes. tends to measure it because it didn't completely end after William came and conquered, but his marks the most the point of the most stability. Before but William, he didn't even stay there. Before William, there was constant uh, squabbling amongst all the local kings because uh -huh. England wasn't united, and the As Vikings and the Romans coming in and destroying things and. <laughs> the Romans were already gone no, I'm after just saying, they left through the, the British... island's history. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. There was instability for a long time. Your agreements before with William. me are getting out of order, out of chronological <laughs> order. The Romans do not matter in this conversation. Okay. <laughs> you might make Can a I Roman continue? sad by saying that they don't matter. They're dead. <laughs> I don't foresee any of them coming back from the grave to to haunt me because I said that they didn't matter 500 years after they left Britain. Sorry, go ahead. I'll, I won't interrupt you anymore. You can interrupt me. Just don't remember. Uh, I don't even remember what I was talking about you now. Were, um, you were saying. Oh, okay. He left. So, yeah. so, well, uh, um, amongst other things, yes. Uh, so after the Romans left. England kind of falls mm -hmm. apart. Uh, various different kings rise up here and there. They have their own different kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, the Vikings do come, and then there starts to be wars back and forth between the Viking invaders setting uh -huh. up their own kingdoms in England and the locals in England trying to establish and uh, try to keep their own kingdoms mm -hmm. and kick the Vikings back out. And this goes on between the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, yeah, uh, for uh, for at least a century. I think it was probably more than that, but I don't remember the dates off the top of my head. 
Um, but when William comes, after that, there's a lot more stability. Um, there are, I, there's at least one or two attempts or at least threats of uh, continued Viking campaigns after William uh, conquers England. But if I remember correctly, both of those end up falling apart because either the guys that were planning them died or they mm. changed their mind and sent their army a different direction. I, I don't remember what all the case was. But th but it's definitely after William's reign that, that England gets... This is why they identify William as the first king. Yeah. This is the first time that, at least since the Romans, that all of England are united under okay. one banner. And there's some stability now. There's still going to be civil wars and there are yeah. going to be invaders from time to time. But it's relatively an established a monarchy from that point forward. An established okay. tradition, I guess you could say. That said, though, yeah, William still spent most of his life in Normandy. Or sorry, in France. And in France, he was fighting lots of battles because he had lands that he owned there mm -hmm. that were constantly being threatened by uh, by other relatives, by other landlords that wanted more land. Sometimes he was in the good graces of the mm -hmm. French king. who France was not united at the time, but there was the kingdom of Francia, which had the most land in the area. Okay. And occasionally he was on good terms with that guy. And sometimes he wasn't on good terms with that guy. So that would lead right. to wars with him or at least the threat of wars with him. So yeah, he spent more of his lifetime in France trying to hold on to his holdings in France uh -huh. than he did in England. If I remember correctly, he is buried in Earl. He was buried in France. He was not buried in England. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think any part of his body is in England. Yeah. It, it, he was buried I don't remember where he was buried, but he was buried somewhere in France. And if I remember correctly, his grave got robbed and looted on at least oh, no. three separate occasions. I think the worst one, if not the last one, was during the French Revolution, where because he was a symbol of royalty and monarchy, I believe they destroyed <laughs> most of his most of his bones, most of everything that remained oh, of him. No. I think only like a, a fragment or two of of his skeleton. I don't remember which parts off the top of my head still exist, and they're I think they're in a church or a monastery somewhere in yeah. France, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. Is he the same as William of Normandy? Yes, William the Conqueror is William of Normandy. And what's Normandy? Normandy is the French word given to the land that was given to the Northmen. William Norman. is a Viking, or the oh. descendants of Vikings. Okay. So yes, the Vikings were called the Northmen or the Normans. Normans. So this area of France that William has inherited, uh -huh. called that is still called Normandy today, this was the area that the King of Francia gave to the invading Vikings to get them to leave him alone. <laughs> It was two part. It was a yeah. two part vote. One uh, one idea uh, was that okay, if we give them this land, they'll leave us alone. Yeah. Two, oh, if we give them this land, then they will protect us from other Vikings or raiders That's or whatnot that will come from that direction. It's a big risk. Worked out for them fairly well. France goes on to not only survive the period but yeah. become one of the most powerful countries in Europe. Okay. So how the heck did he do that? How how did William? successfully conquer all those tiny little kingdoms and stuff in Great Britain. Well, okay, was well, he just he, that awesome? He and luckily a lot of the work was done before, uh, by his uh, by the predecessors who were fighting over him. So he just took William, credit for all the work. Yes, William had the advantage of uh, showing up late to the party after the others had all what? wiped themselves out. By the time of William, the I, I I might be getting some of my details here. By the time that William is eventually coming, mm -hmm. England is already kind of unified into one and one into one body there okay. are still some there are still some norman settlement or some viking settlements there are still your english settlements okay. um but uh, but it, it largely the country is under one rule under one king uh edward the confessor i believe is, his is that name. his daddy or what uh no it wasn't william's dad it uh he had some relation to William, but I don't remember. It might have been a cousin or an uncle or something to that nature. Okay. I, I don't remember for sure. But uh, th this is this is where William gets his claim to the throne. I believe Edward says, I'm going to make you my heir. Oh. But then Edward dies. William is in Normandy on yeah. the other side of the channel. So the British people aren't, or they're not British at this point. So yeah. the the English people, they're not inclined to say, oh yeah, that guy over there is our king. Yeah. So they uh, basically, uh, I don't, I can't Start say Start to go elect, feral again? I can't say they elect him. Some other guy, uh, Harold, I believe is his name. <laughs> or was Harold that. the other guy? Crap, now I'm, I'm getting mixed up. <laughs> I think his name was Harold. Harold, who is a who is a local, mm -hmm. he basically assumes the throne, uh, makes himself Edward. king of England. 
Uh, but at the same time that Harold has done this, there's another Viking coming to try to yeah. retake the lands and gain back the possessions that his people have gotten in England over time. Okay. So, uh, so Harold is arguing, is saying that he's the king now. Yeah. And he's he's the one that's there, so he's the one in control at the moment. Right. But he knows the Vikings are coming, and William is coming also. Harold is basically in the hard point of this, but basically whoever, whatever two get there first are yeah. going to fight it out, yeah. and then the survivor, the victor of that battle, is going to hope that they have enough strength left to beat William when he gets here. Dude. Harold defeats the Vikings. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the name of the battle, but there's a lot of good stories about it. Uh, there's a uh, one of my favorite stories is, um, if I remember correctly, uh, when the Vikings are forced to retreat, there's like a single lone berserker who mm -hmm. stands on a bridge that they're using to retreat. Yeah. When Harold's men try to, ch to pursue them across the bridge, this lone berserker like stands there and kills like a hundred of the British. So they, <laughs> One against. They, they eventually kill the guy, but yeah. the, 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 it's, it's, it's a story of Viking. Oh yeah, hero. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> heroism and the terror that the Vikings have yeah. put up in. But anyway, yes, Harold wins that fight. I sure hope that I'm remembering it right, because <laughs> Harold was either the guy who wins, or Harold was the name of the Viking leader, and I'm, I don't remember. <laughs> so then Harold turns south to go uh, fight William off. Okay. Uh, they engage with each other at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, arguably, Harold should win this fight. He has the high ground. Uh, and but... we know from Star Wars that all you need is the high ground, and <laughs> no one can come against you. Harold should win this fight. He has the high <laughs> ground, but uh, William is able to defeat him. If I remember correctly, uh, William uses several cavalry charges. William has the advantage in cavalry. William uses several cavalry charges to kind of break up the Harold's formations. Mm -hmm. This leaves Harold and his men vulnerable to archers because they're oh. broken up. They're not forming a solid defensive barrier. And uh, there are probably more to it than that, but those are the only details that yeah. are coming to my head. Um, and uh, eventually Harold himself, I believe, does get shot. Uh, and I don't remember if he dies just then or there, but him getting shot is definitely not going to be a good William wins. Moral, um, boost to morale in the battle. But yeah, William is able to win the Battle of Hastings. Mm -hmm. And now because the Vikings are gone, they're not going to come back for a while. And Harold, the only real challenger that he had, yeah. is now defeated. Then everybody kind it's of his. assumes, yeah, it's William's. So then he's just got to clean it up and make sure everyone. Uh, no, it was a lot more complicated than that. So William, uh, after even though he's not there for most of this, William has his agents. In addition to going around and writing the Doomsday Book, yeah. William has his people go all throughout England building castles. He builds lots and lots of castles. Oh. And when I say castles, we're not talking rock and mortar castles. Yeah. No, we're talking wooden fortress castles. He builds okay. lots and lots of these because he knows that. All right. I've got to maintain order. I've so, got to maintain my power in this place. So military so forts or vacation homes for himself? Military forts okay. where soldiers loyal to him are going yeah. to stay and police the population um, to make sure that they stay in line. Yeah. Sure, arguably they're going to defend the people from if the Vikings do come back and whatnot. But in theory. no, more so they're there to... This, this is an old rule of conquest. Mm -hmm. You can't... And uh, it surprises me that not too many people tend to understand this. You don't just march your army on the capital mm -hmm. city, defeat the defenders there, mm -hmm. take the capital city, and then, ah, we win. It's everybody is Everybody belongs to me now. Yeah, have a feast. Oh, so, uh, I'll done. use World War II for an example. The Nazis took Paris very quickly in the war. Yeah. Uh, France didn't surrender. The, the French government surrendered, but the French people didn't surrender. They didn't so all the just Nazi go, okay, I guess I'm German now. Yeah, the Nazis had to keep large numbers of troops in France throughout the entire rest yeah. of the war to keep the people in line. Okay. It, it's an old rule of conquest. Yeah, you can't just defeat them and then expect the people mm -hmm. to be happy and accept that, oh, you're our boss yeah. now. No, you have to build fortresses to mm. maintain order. Maintain order for a lot of reasons. Yes, to keep the locals in line, but yeah. also to protect locals from anybody else that might be coming to conquer your yeah. kingdom. So how how did he manage to... So, sorry, one more thing. So yeah. one could argue then that one of the things that enables William to last, uh, or at least William's lineage, legacy, uh -huh. to last better than previous ones was, mm -hmm. was because of all those castles and yeah, maintaining a helps. sense of order. Okay, but what was stopping someone else to be like, well, William's gone, 
I can make these soldiers loyal to me. I'll just waltz in here and take the throne instead. I'm sure some people probably tried. Uh, in fact, I know that some, throughout history, several people did try to take advantage of mm -hmm. at least other kings' absence. I don't remember the names off the top of my head, but I'm pretty sure there were more than a couple that attempted to do mm -hmm. the same in William's time. But uh, usually what would happen in that case, because so you're, you're talking about people doing that in England. Yeah. People were doing that to William's lands in, in France. They found out, oh, he's over there in England. Hey, this is a golden opportunity. Let's go well, take yeah, some of that land. Yeah, it seems obvious. So William would have to sail back to France to go fight those battles. And if it became a big enough problem <laughs> in England, well, then he would go back to England to fight those battles. Maybe he should have just been content with one area of land instead of having to go back and forth across the English Channel every day. You know that. And I know that. But man does not know that. Men want power. People want right. power. I dare right. say that ambition is a far more mm -hmm. common characteristic of humans mm -hmm. than humility is. Oh, for sure. And um, and also to be fair, so we, we I, I just said like this was ambition, like he wanted mm -hmm. to conquer it. But bear in mind, in William's eyes, Edward had promised this to him. Ed, in William's mind, he was not going out there and right. conquering some new lands for himself. He was securing what was rightfully his. Okay, but he could have gifted that to someone else. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seems like a lot of unnecessary work. Just like his doomsday book was a lot of unnecessary work. <laughs> Were all your inventory when you were running your business unnecessary But again, work? I'm poor, so every penny did matter. You're telling me that uh, that uh, Donald Trump, that uh, Bill Gates, that uh, Mark Zuckerberg, you're telling mm -hmm. me that they don't do inventory of their budgets, of their resources, <laughs> I have uh, to no know idea. What, for them to know no what idea. they have and what they can move down, about, what they can do something with at any given time? But like down to the amount of paper clips? Do they? I do, would doubt that they know to the amount of paper clips, but I'll bet you mm -hmm. somewhere in an office that they mm -hmm. own, somebody's got a count of the paper clips. <laughs> I guess so. If maybe if not a count, at least a record of this is how many boxes of paper clips that we have bought in since going into business. Oh yeah, sure. I guess that makes sense. Okay, so records are an important <laughs> thing. Records have always been an important thing. Without records. We don't know what happened yesterday. I guess I'm just disappointed that the Doomsday book isn't actually about Doomsday. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, read Dante's Inferno. If you're going to give it the an predictions awesome name, of Nostradamus. Then... <laughs> There's some nice Doomsday predictions in there for you. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Okay, is there anything else you can tell me about William the Conqueror, William of Normandy, the Doomsday book, Vikings? I don't know. There's lots more to say about some of those things. So was William the Conqueror a Viking? Anymore. Would he call himself a Viking? He wouldn't have called himself a Viking, but he was a descendant of Vikings. He was a Norman. So was he civilized? I, Is I that the difference? I wouldn't be surprised if he was proud of his Viking heritage. He, mm -hmm. I would say he, certain, he must... You know, it is more than likely he knew about his Viking heritage. Mm -hmm. But no, by the time he was born, the Vikings had been in France for yeah. a while. They spoke French. They had assimilated to French culture yeah. for the most part. Okay. So that, that, and there goes another thing. When William conquered England, he made French the official language of the government. <laughs> if I remember correctly, at least two or three other kings go by after him before we get it. Before England gets a king that speaks English and then sets every uh, sets all the official records and right. whatnot of court to English instead which, of French. Which by then is the language of the people. Yes. Interesting. It is interesting, isn't it? It's records are interesting. Fascinating. You know how I know all this stuff? Wow. Well, because some people kept records. <laughs> Nobody, and they didn't have wives that sat next to them one day and said, hey, why are you writing down all this stuff about uh, who <laughs> conquered who and who killed who and who was in charge at this point in time? Uh -huh. Does it really matter? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think we're done. Thank you for listening. If you like time and all eternity, <laughs> it's never done. If you liked what you heard, then please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a five star review. If you'd like to donate money to the Protect Christopher from his Mean Cruel Wife <laughs> Fund, please donate at. Or sorry, that's the wrong line. We do have a Buy Our Kids a Pizza link. If people are interested in that, it's in the description. We need to establish Speaking a of buy, money. We need to establish a Buy Christopher a Man Cave link so that he can take shelter from these <laughs> these these heinous assaults on me.
All right. If you'd like to hear a future episode with more information about today's topic, contact us on Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Married to History Pod. Also, please contact us if you have a silly question idea or if there's something from history that you would love to learn about. Just be sure to specify in your message if it's silly or serious because we don't want to treat a genuine quest for knowledge as a joke. Talk to you next time. Isn't that all we do is treat genuine quest for knowledge yes. as a joke? It's all you do. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm a homeschool mom that relies on good curriculum, Christopher and Annie, to teach our kids music. Our... Start that again. I'm sh- ah, ah, you couldn't make it through. <clears throat> I'm, it was the last word. <laughs> I almost said teach our kids musicals. I teach our kids musicals. <laughs> all right. And it shows all the states or areas where the mass practice. Where the Emancipation emanci- Proclamation. I'm trying. Where the Emancipation Proclamation actually affected.